Hi, everyone. I want to thank Jacopo and the organizers for inviting me. I'm really honored and humbled to be able to speak here. And for today, I want to present some ideas I developed for a chapter uh, for the Handbook of Neuroaesthetics, which is still in progress. It's a kind of an update to a paper I wrote 10 years ago, Putting Reward in Art, uh, where I started to apply predictive processing uh, ideas to art. Uh, the view has uh, broader, broadened quite a bit, uh, but I leave the more systematic version to the chapter, uh, which I'll give a link to at the end. Here I'll focus on uh, illustrating a few key ideas in a much more associative, but hopefully uh, thought-provoking way. The guiding questions in my work are these. What do we look for? Uh, why do we prefer what we prefer? Why do we value what we value? Uh, what do we appreciate aesthetically? I put aesthetically between brackets because I find art uh, an interesting use case, uh, but it's the more general uh, principles I want to try to get at. These are the principles of valuation. In other words, how do we come to value things? Uh, and I will use four oppositions to structure this talk. The first is between two broad philosophical views of value. On the one hand, there's the view that values are eternal, uh, self-evident, objective. Um, for example, values are often thought to be rooted in our biology, in, in evolution, in our core biological needs or emotion programs. Uh, for aesthetic values, people often talk about universal uh, aesthetic values, even rooted in mathematical properties. Um, however, clearly those uh, biological needs or mathematical principles are insufficient to explain the myriad of specific ways in which people shape their lives. Um, what people want and what people value even goes against uh, basic biological um, concerns sometimes. And aesthetics is an example, but far from the only example here. Um, on the other hand, you have the view of values of references that are just idiosyncratic. And values are variable and dependent on personal tastes. Um, and so they are resistant, or they're supposed to be resistant to general principles. But then you can wonder whether preferences are really that, that arbitrary. And, and what in this view then accounts for the directionality or the normativity in our experience? Um, what it's like to be moved and to have uh, values of preferences? This is insufficiently explained. Uh, even by um, biological concerns. The way predictive processing tries to tackle this is by making a clean slate, by stepping back and zooming out to mere existence. Tautologically, um, existing is producing future. It's ensuring that state at time t can be predicted from time t minus one. It is, in effect, in fact, creating a pattern so we can describe living as patterning in the service of the pattern. Um, the key thing for, for predictive processing is to tune in and create useful uh, patterns to support life, um, so the continuation of the pattern. Um, the core pattern here, of course, is what we often describe as homeostasis, uh, a regular set of expected interceptive states uh, that is man maintained into the future. Uh, but of course, we tune into numerous other patterns um, as hidden causes of explaining our sensory inputs um, and which help to regenerate those interceptive states that we want to fulfill. Um, good examples of the kind of mid sized uh, hidden causes or constructs that we um, that populate our world are clouds, for example, that allow us to predict patterns in the inputs. Uh, with regard to darkness or coldness on Earth and in, in our environment. Um, but of, of course, our world is populated by agents as well and by goals and intentions of those uh, agents. These mental states that we ascribe, just like clouds, uh, they, they predict uh, complex and extended patterns of inputs and um, allow us to predict the actions of others and ourselves better. Um, and preferences is, of course, just one uh, subset of those mental states and inferred causes.
So preferences are our kind of inferences, uh, what we do for others, uh, inferring their preferences based on their behavior. We also do for ourselves, we infer, infer uh, what we want based on sampling of our own behavior. Uh, we, are, we infer who we are. Um, so preferences are a shorthand in cause for a complex composite of multimodal sensory cues and their associated reactive uh, dispositions that we have. Um, the regular structures summarizing a complex of sensory motor flow and they of course allow communication and coordinated action but more importantly maybe they also allow us to build generative models of those packets of experience. Um, we can create thereby a, a kind of abstract model of value and there's quite some evidence for this kind of view, most notably maybe in defining that the mere act of choosing something, similar to the mere act of perceiving something, is shown to increase subsequent preferences for it. Um, by our past reactions, we infer value. Um, but preferences are phenomenally transparent in Metzinger's sense that we experience them as direct, as given with no access to the preference forming of the valuation processes. But one could still wonder whether those regular uh, packages of sensory and motor flow explain enough of the phenomenology of, um, of preferences of values, the directionality of the preferences. Thus just describing them as just another cause uh, that we use to, to minimize prediction errors, just another inference. Does that sufficiently explain the pleasure or displeasure attached to them? Uh, and not so much to other inferences or beliefs that we have. Of course, in predictive processing, the directionality can only come from our patterning performance, the system's ability to minimize prediction errors, to reduce uncertainty. Um, so could patterning be the one concern to rule them all? Um, it's definitely um, as biological as we saw the other conventional needs and and according to predictive processing also more fundamental of course than those needs motivations and then even then reward maximization because there's multiple problems with the concept of reward as as many people have pointed out there's a circularity of reward where reward is defined as a function of increasing behavior and simultaneously invoked as an explanation of that behavior um, next rewards are also too sparse and insufficient as a learning device. A toddler wanting a cookie reward in the cupboard um, would do well to first learn many unrewarded intermediate steps, intermediate skills, instead of trying in vain immediately to reach the cookie right away. There's also a problem in that there is no external teacher in real life. Uh, that can provide the right reward function, the right value function for the agent, contrary to lab, uh, lab environments. Uh, uh, biological evolution is, of course, assumed to be the teacher for the organism, but preferences cannot be specified in, in this way, at least not in humans, in which what is valuable varies greatly within life. And lastly, values are also very much dependent on, on inter internal states, for example, satiety, um, and on context, as many uh, experiments uh, have shown. So what predictive processing puts in its place is the patterning or the self-evidencing. It's about minimizing prediction errors and thereby gathering evidence for the model that the organism embodies. And, and self-evidencing or uncertainty reduction may give the impression of a static self it may be less palatable for um, artists or even scientists of behavior. Um, and it may be more, more subject to misconceptions about what predictive processing uh, entails. Uh, the patterning concept emphasizes that the self is more extendable and flexible, but in the end, the, the concepts uh, amount in the same. Patterning or self-evidencing are just the positive equivalent of the principle of uncertainty minimization of predictive processing. We'll get back to this discussion, uh, but first we need to uh, discuss our second opposition and how predictive processing dissolves it. The second opposition is the stark distinction deeply rooted in Western thinking and intuition 
that the affective and motivational the cognitive uh, can be strictly separated from the uh, cognitive or the epistemic. So we have the desires, the preferences, the goals, the values versus the beliefs, the inferences, the expectations, the facts. Um, it is in this spirit that science uh, wrote the seminal work, Preferences Need No Inferences, that I allude to in my title. He uh, defended the primacy of a fact over cognition. Uh, but for science, perception was direct, objective, and somehow raw. And of course, we have come to learn with Bayesian accounts that perception is, is inference. So unless we have some precognitive abilities, it's impossible for preferences not to uh, depend on inferences. Um, indeed, we just saw that preferences can even be described themselves as kind of inference. Um, so predictive processing does away with this stark opposition, but it does so in an even more fundamental way. This is clear from the way predictions or models are conceived in the predict predictive processing account. Uh, predictions or models have an optimistic bias, so they have a cognitive uh, aspect to them. Um, a model is not purely an epistemic, representational or veridical uh, concept. Uh, for example, the agent expects, for example, homeostatically, uh, to be in a certain range of state that is not the most likely range in, of states in the environment, for example, in terms of uh, glucose levels. Uh, so preferences are here uh, expected interceptive observations, and there's something aspirational about this. Uh, we want glucose to be in um in a certain range of state but the optimism also is a controlled kind of optimism because it needs to be backed by a generative model a sequence of actions that can uh, accomplish the expected interceptive states an organism that tries to be that accurate about what what happens in the world around without regards for its own patterns its own resources uh, will be dead in the water. And similarly, an, an organism that uh, just engages with a wishful hallucination uh, of more favorable uh, circumstances will be equally dead. Um, so predictive predictions are in an important way optimistic constructs that negotiate their uh, direction of fit. The direction of fit can be belief-like, can be updating my mind to the world, or it can be desire-like, I can be shaping the world to my mind. I might want, have the goal to be the best in my class in maths, but if I notice along the way that I don't have talent for it, uh, of course I will lower my expectation, making the goal into an, adapt an adaptable prediction, uh, so changing the direction of fit. So this way, uh, there's a negotiation going on uh, based on the direct uh, uncertainties uh, we accumulate about the states that I can attain with my actions. One can easily see how this reasoning puts the darkroom criticism to bed. Uh, just to remind you, the darkroom problem is the idea that we would end up in a darkroom uh, if we would just be trying to eliminate all our prediction errors, because the dark room would allow full predictability uh, if you just predict darkness. Um, but of course, eliminating prediction errors at those lowest levels by darkness, uh, it usually doesn't uh, predict anything useful. We want to see clouds and mid-level objects uh, that allow us to fulfill our interceptive op optimistic expectations. This thus fulfilling the whole hierarchical models rather than just eliminating errors at the lowest, lowest ranks. Uh, and of course, an additional complementary way to respond to the darkroom problem is by noting that with the inclusion of action and predictive processing uh, comes a focus not only on minimization of prediction errors in the here and now, but also in the future. Uh, precisely to be able to fulfill this complete hierarchical models instead of just our lowest level uh, predictions. So to predict well uh, also means, importantly, to learn when one can predict, when more data is needed. So basically we need to fine-tune the rhythm of our sampling 
of the world uh, based on the precision or the reliability of, of evidence. Um, so we explore the world to disclose its structure uh, to reduce future prediction errors by epistemic actions uh, and thereby seek precise, informative or reducible prediction errors. So there's another big reason why the cognitive and the epistemic cannot be separated neatly in the predictive processing view. Uh, it has the balance between pragmatic concerns and epistemic ones uh, built in. Um, uncertainty minimization can be unpacked in pragmatic and epistemic parts on equal footing. Um, they're all form formulated in terms of, of prediction errors or divergences between distributions. We uh, explore, we use prediction errors to disclose and learn the structure of the environment. Uh, and we use prediction errors to minimize divergences between um, the priors or preferred observation and the expected ones under some actions. So one could say that pragmatic progress is epistemically evaluated by the divergences between distributions, uh, while a certainty uh, reduction is clearly uh, the, the epistemic part is clearly also cognitive in predictive processing. Basically, exploiting is going with the implicit assumption that the future will be the same as the past. So uh, there's a pleasure of pragmatic rewards, expected inputs, um, and sensory inputs, basically, that our generative models can easily reconstruct, um, which refers to mere exposure and familiarity effect. But uh, of course, lack like with a second glass of water that is after a long hot walk, walk already less pleasurable, um, frequently presented stimuli or, or habits are not necessarily marked with, with pleasure, maybe except after a trying day of uncertainty, then it would be possible to, to have pleasure there. Um, and of course, not being able to engage with your habits can be very unpleasant. But what this seems to imply is that the approach that the actively redu active reduction of uncertainty and the change in prediction errors relative to your expected states, your preferences, your goals. Um, so the learning or epistemic progress is, is what provides the, the big emotions here. Okay, just to take a brief step back from the theory. I'm going to briefly discuss a study using Moody images, like the one you, you see here. In these perceptual puzzles, there's no re recognition uh, without help. You just have a disordered complex percept, but there's instant uh, recognition once the solution has been revealed. Uh, and you cannot unsee it. There's a strong phenomenological shift. Uh, you also have usually a, a strong a high lateness, a positive, uh, affective feeling, uh, the perceptual insight. And knowing the solution really compresses your mental representation of the Mooney. Uh, so there's some information gain. Uh, I want to quickly sneak in two great examples from Belgian artists uh, to show that uh, perception of Mooney images has some uh, relevance at least as a simplified model of aesthetic processes. Here's an example from Jan van Riet uh, from one of his expositions. And here's uh, Jean Vesselman's uh, painting, where again you see this style of high contrast, distorted and thresholded uh, images that is reminiscent of the, of the Mooney images. But back to the comparably boring world of experiments. Our procedure was as follows. We showed a lot of subjects, um, many Mooney images, um, and we asked them to rate their curiosity. And afterwards, we asked them for an open guess on, on the content of the image. And we used those guesses um, to compute and crowdsource um, a semantic entropy measure. Um, reflecting uh, the, the entropy of the distribution of the semantic candidates um, before any resolution was, was shown. Um, so the in information gain is then quantified as the change in this distribution and the entropy of the distribution, because after the solution, of course, uh, the entropy is, is zero when people know the solution of the image. 
there's only one semantic candidate uh, available. So we can use the, the entropy of the original distribution as an estimate of the information gain. And at the very end, of course, we ask for uh, ratings of their aha, their positive aha experience when, when they've seen the solution. So here are some of the results of the paper. Much more can be found in the paper. But first we found that curiosity predicts aha, which uh, in turn predicts later recognition memory in a separate uh, memory test that we added. Uh, this is somewhat relevant for an account that tries to link learning to um, effect. But secondly, and most importantly, we found that the information gain, as we measured in the entropy measure, predicts the positive aha feeling after the solution. And it also, to a lesser extent, predicts uh, curiosity pre-solution. So this suggests that positive effect uh, depends on information gain. Um, and that curiosity might be an imperfect sense of the expected information gain. So this is what I summarize here. Um, expected predictive progress is when we have a sense of re where reducible prediction errors are situated. Uh, and this is experienced as interest or curiosity. It's of course related to uh, ideas on the zone of proximal development where um, by having a sense of where learning gain can be made, we avoid spending time in environments that are too complex to many prediction errors, or they are overlearned and there are no reducible prediction errors left, just uh, prediction errors due to noise. And of course, actual predictive progress then is hypothesized to be this sense of when we've made compression or information gain, and this is then supposed to be experienced as joy or pleasure, uh, appreciation. And that is, of course, related to work by people like Schmidt Huber, who have linked um, the pleasure to the first derivative of prediction error over time. Okay, so now we have some tools to uh, tackle the third opposition, which is between, on the one hand, the view that uh, we like things that are simple or ordered or familiar um, uh, or fluently processed. And of course, the Gestaltists are the most important proponents of this view uh, with their principle of perceptual parsimony um, that says that we complete and we prefer uh, figures uh, in the most uh, simple and most ordered uh, configurations, like in this figure to the right, we'll see the symmetric uh, uh, figures uh, instead of the more, more complex ones that are actually also in there. The fluency theorists, uh, they are somewhat in the same tradition in the sense that they uh, emphasize pers persimony as well, but persimony of processing, so a more subject dependent view of that. Uh, that has a role of prototypicality and learning. Uh, on the other side, we have the Goldilocks principle and the optimal level theories that you'll be familiar with, which says that we, we have um, a preference for intermediate complexity or predictability or uncertainty. And of course, Berlin and, and more recently Kit and Dahl are proponents and have gathered evidence for, for this. Because indeed, it's more in line with empirical findings, for example, on the inverted U curve uh, relation between um, intermediate complexity and, and appreciation. And of course, also with art, where we find that violations of uh, regularities or uh, symmetries, like this example here by Bridget Riley, uh, that has some broken symmetry where the, where the pattern is recoverable with some effort. So as I hinted at, uh, by putting uh, the emphasis on the dynamics of processing, we can uh, reconcile the two camps. We can describe um, what perceived as like more in terms of subjective progress or expected subjective progress that they make in dealing with the stimulus or the activity. So a change in fluency or an increase in the system's compression going from unpredictable or complex to predictable or simple. 
Here's an example from Hepp's classic work. It illustrates the tension within the simplicity principle. The line is, of course, simple as such, which might make you expect little meaning in it, but that changes, of course, immediately, probably because your visual system already registers that the line deviates, uh, so there's a prediction error, but what you expect for an average or a random line to look like. So in what seemed to be unassuming beginnings, there's already a cycle of interest and curiosity and discovery and appreciation. Um, the prediction error in the line uh, creates the suggestion of an intention of the drawer, which creates um, an expected reducibility of the prediction error, uh, and which leads then to the discovery of the face. Um, and then possibly some remaining prediction error because the face has a, has, still has an, an odd contour. Um, so the discovery possibly of the second phase. So is goodness or appreciation then due to those processes, those dynamics of uncertainty uh, in the brief time span that we have, or just due to the, the original simplicity? Um, and I would say, of course, the former. Here's a video example where you'll see there's always a buildup of an expectation some violations and then return to predictability by a switch of the generative model that we apply. So the eggs turn out to be egg-shaped ping pong balls. So it's very satisfying. Um, and the advantage of video is that these dynamics of creating and resolving uncertainty can be made much more explicit in time as, as they can in, in music. So the art can become more accessible, but it can also easily become gimmicky as well. So artists intuitively or intentionally add prediction errors in their work uh, to allow us to have some predictive progress. And it's of course not necessarily the meaning or the structure of the artist that we will settle on. But still, we build up a generative model of the work, um, for example, the alt brush strokes that we detect. And that generative model can uh, include all our familiar things in the world. But of course, because we know it's created by a uh, human, it can obviously also um, include emotions as latent causes uh, to make irregularities regular. What all these examples links is the generation effect. I take this term from memory studies where it is a well-known principle that if you generate it, construct it or infer something yourself, you will remember it better. And that's of course used by advertisers. It's, it's not simplicity principle, of course, it's almost an anti-simplicity uh, principle. Um, if we have generated it ourselves with some internal action, effort or cost that is spent in the prediction error currency, uh, then it seems more true, more memorable and more pleasing or positive. And of course, here we see that, uh, for example, with HAP's uh, figure, uh, that simplicity can be complex because absences become important in, in a predictive account, and become important as, as obstacles. And so we latch on to differences, to deviations in lines, uh, brush strokes, that may or may not make a difference uh, in the end. And even those that don't matter, that don't make a difference. So where, where we are temporarily laboring in vain, they influence our further processing and affect um, because they reconfigure, they lower our meta expectation whether, on whether differences will be reducible. Um, and so it allows us to make unexpected progress and prediction error minimization the effectively best kind, I would say. And the degeneration effect, of course, aligns well with Yeats' definition of joy or happiness as growth uh, instead of any particular uh, thing. To me, this is predictive processing providing the language to articulate the beholder's chair that psychologists and philosophers of aesthetics have long thought about and sought after. Often this resulted in the use of physical analogs or metaphors like forces or tensions or fields. And predictive processing largely validates that, but puts some tractable flesh on 
uh, on this these ideas in the form of uh, the predictive dynamics, um, where expectations are formed not only about the content level, but also about the method level of content generating processes and the expected fluency or rates of uncertainty reduction. But there is a general theory of motivation and effect hidden here, not just applying to art, I think. Um, I was happy to find like Reynolds work from the early 70s on curiosity and exploration. He developed, developed the theory of curiosity that is, is little known, at least compared to Berlin's work from the same era. But his theory was based on rodent behavior and uh, he argued that curiosity is about um, an expected rate of cognitive structuring that the individual tries to maintain by exploration or lack thereof. And cognitive structuring is a somewhat dated term, but McReynolds used it to refer to the process of assimilation by which uh, new perceptual inputs are made to fit with existing schemata or models. And it translates well to and the expected rates of prediction error minimization. Um, the general theory of, of effect that emerged there and, and has been proposed by several authors in recent years is that effect is a kind of non-conceptual experience of monitoring of those uncertainty dynamics or meta expectations on rates of uncertainty minimization over longer time windows. And of course, relative to our goals, aspirations and predictions. So positive effect is, is, is not linked to conventional reward per se, but uh, learning dynamics, especially specifically one success in learning the structure of the environment. And there's some uh, recent empirical evidence for this as well. And of course, there's theories about uh, humor and intense, uh, intensely pleasurable experiences that might also link to unexpected progress, so higher than expected rates of, of uncertainty reduction, uh, and conversely, anxiety as, as uh, lower than expected rates of prediction or reduction. People that have seen talks of me before know that I don't skip any opportunity to show this little video of an artful interaction, illustrating the close intertwinings of, of dynamics of uncertainty and affect. It's a video of mommy blowing her nose and it brings up all kinds of emotions. So the baby gets fearful, uh, presumably because of increasing prediction errors. The mother covers her face and makes weird, unexpected noises. But then the joy arrives when, with the sudden return of predictability. The kind of joy that wouldn't be had without the horror, probably. Is it then worth going through the horror? Um, artists definitely seem to play with this. I want to emphasize that I don't underestimate the empirical challenges of tracking the dynamics of essentially hidden variables. So the, the, the challenges of testing this kind of account. There is innovative work around this, which I cover in the chapter, but I won't have time to go into here. But back to art for our last opposition. It should be clear by now that um, the account I'm proposing tries to stay away from two extremes. Um, on the one hand, the idea that art is merely problem solving, merely closure or resolution, um, which would be a deflationary account of, of art appreciation and and would reduce it to a gimmick, an empty gimmick, something artificial. On the other hand, there's the extreme of art as uncertainty, inducing, destabilizing, disturbance, disturbing outlandishness for the sake of outlandishness, would of course also become a gimmick, or empty or artificial. Artists mostly don't deliberately search for the sweet spot of uncertainty reducibility uh, in their audience. They also, they always leave the risk of, of leaving their audience in, in the dark and often rely on cultural learning process to catch up with their, their ideas of regularities uh, or meaning in the work. But at least they, it's fair to say, I think they meet some people some of the time. So, so maybe even the more elevated capacities of art can be approached with this kind of account. Because it's about sense breaking and sense making that works on many levels and 
It's about the epistemic not being separate from the existential because our models define us. The self is a hidden cause, part of the model. So self transformation, like some authors have um, pointed out, is important in art. Um, it can be seen in this context as well. We like to see the struggle um, as we do in these kind of figures um, by Rolf Ammer. And there's a poet, a Dutch poet, uh, Nutze Bird, who says in Dutch, Alles van Waarde is weerloos. And it translates um, into something that sounds le less pleasurable in English, but still, everything of value is defenseless, um, he says. And that points, of course, to the, the idea that effort is necessary to sustain value. Uh, that is, is an essential part of value. We can phrase it in uh, terms of attunement of generative models between viewers and implicit artists via their work. So reading a good novel, for example, can provide us with unexpected attunement um, with core but unarticulated dynamics of the self, uh, even or especially if those dynamics concern negative emotions. Uh, a piece of art can provide validation or external evidence for the type of regularities in our own uh, mental life that we consider very personal and idiosyncratic. Um, and in this way, art supports self-evidencing at a very fundamental and human level. And with that constellation, uh, art, art puts in motion a self-reinforcing cycle in the sense that validation of your models will provide you with the confidence and safety um, to be read as and they give you the expectation of a good rate of prediction, error, minimization in a given context so that you can be curious again and explore prediction errors that afford new meaning. This may go some way to explain art's most puzzling capacities. Uh, Keats characterized the artist's mind by a negative capability, that is, when a man is capable of being in uncertainties, mysteries and doubts, without irritable reaching after fact and reason, which of course clashes with the uncertainty minimization principle. Like greedy reward optimization makes one miss out opportunities for better rewards. Uh, a focus on greedy information gain, uh, predictive progress, would foreclose discovery of new, more efficient uh, regularities and better uncertainty minimization. So we need to rel relinquish uh, the focus on information gain relative to our current models to radically be able to reconfigure the hypothesis space uh, of our models and try on different self models. Um, as we saw, unexpected information gains feel better than mere gains, but of course it's impossible to use uh, information gain as a guide towards unexpected gains except by deliberately staying with or increasing one's uncertainty. Um, and thereby, it seems like the artist's mind um, defies uh, prediction error and minimization by dwelling in uncertainty or staying with the trouble. Of course, it's clear that increasing uncertainty no or noise um, can have crucial functions in our modeling of the world. Um, in daily life, we usually have only sparse, biased, and indirect data to constrain our uh, predictive models. So there's always a danger of uh, overfitting, of tuning our models too strongly to the experiences we had. In AI, the deliberate injection of noise inputs is a proven technique um, to improve the generalized ability of predictive models and to reduce their complexity. Intuitively, it shakes up, it shakes the system out of its uh, categories, out of its habits or predictions that were too, too tuned to particular features of the limited and biased sample of experiences. Um, so art can then be seen as a kind of dry running of different models and an artificial data creation to settle on better global uh, error minima. So the function of added uncertainty might be clear. The mystery still remains as to how artists manage so well to dwell in uncertainty. And there may be lessons here in children playing and failing. Uh, here's an example. 
of a child playing with a stroller and falling 15 times in a row, but continuing to get at it. Artists seem to, seem to be able to tap into this kind of beginner's mind uh, with the optimism that goes with that. Uh, the optimism concerning the eventual reducibility of uncertainties. Um, and there's probably a role of social trust here, the safe context that allow children to play uh, where safe should again be understood as characterized by uncertainties that are either inconsequential are reducible with assistance, for example, from a trusted parent. Um, social trust in this sense is bound to be important for art production and, and experience as well. From a more unexpected direction, single celled organisms might provide uh, another lesson. Uh, these organisms seem to be able to upregulate their mutation rate, uh, de facto increasing their uncertainty specifically when they encounter a harsh, unexpected environment. They do so in order to increase the chance of the population to tap into new, useful regularities and survive this environment. And of course, artists seem to be able to do this within the organism by inviting, channeling uncertainty and maybe by better compartmentalizing their models so they can um, uh, evaluate them freely and playfully uh, without threat to the rest of their models. Uh, so they create hypotheses and models and make them die in their stead, as Popper said. And that's all I have. I want to thank my collaborators on this work, uh, Agnes Moores and Joel Bervoets. Um, and I'm looking forward to your thoughts. Uh, here's the link to the chapter draft that I promised. Uh, thank you.